Setra the Imperishable, King of Kings, High King of Nehakara, Lord of the Earth, Monarch of the Sky, Ruler of the Four Horizons, Mighty Lion of the Infinite Desert, Great Hawk of the Heavens, Majestic Emperor of the Shifting Sands, Eternal Sovereign of Khemri's Legions, and so much more. Great was this ruler who ruled in both life and death. Where many years after his original passing, his people, many generations later, still remember the golden age he brought upon them, saving them from a war which was shattering Nehakara from within, and finally uniting his people. Born into a powerful family, in a time of civil war, famine and drought, Setra served under his father. He was skilled far beyond most of the generals under his father's service. His warriors trusted and respected him. Under his father's command, Setra would lead the warriors of Khemri towards many victories, and with this he won the hearts of many of his people. When his father passed away, it was only fit that Setra would rule, and while a few pretenders did rise up against him, they were quickly crushed under his might. Setra inherited a land that was beset in constant war, drought and famine. Many of the lesser kings were needlessly sending their servants to die while they should be united, united under his rule and his rule alone. Setra became a king in a time long before nations such as the Empire or Bretonia even existed, but his country of Nehakara was already ancient. The cities grew tall and the kingdom vast. Because of this, many of the ancient kings were incredibly proud and vain with Setra not being an exception. Setra aspired not to rule only Nehakara, but the world itself. But first, he needed the undying loyalty of his people, before he may muster Khemri to war. Setra needed to prove himself, not only to his people, but to the gods of Nehakara, that he should be the undisputed ruler of the world, in a paradise fit for a great king of his prestige. During only the first year of his reign, as soon as he took over the throne, Setra commanded his people to get right to work. With the many temples and statues to the gods in Khemri being repaired and restored, such acts gained him notice by the gods of Nehakara, but this was still not yet enough, for the drought and famine in the region was killing indiscriminately, and on the anniversary of his coronation, Setra made a mighty sacrifice in order to win the favor of his gods. Setra would prove his devotion to his people and his gods. He begged of the gods to restore Khemri to its former glory and to grant him the strength to subdue all the lesser kings so that the people of Nehakara would rise as one and rule the world. To prove himself, Setra would do the unthinkable. He sacrificed his children, his own flesh and blood, in the name of the gods. With this great sacrifice, the gods took notice of the king of Khemri, and with that granted him their boon. The very next day, for the first time in decades, the great Vitae river flooded. Fresh water was now available to the people of Khemri. Diseases washed away, and crops would grow into a bountiful harvest. Khemri was seeing its best years to come, and it was only natural that its people and priesthood looked to Setra as their savior with many, if not all of them, now believing that he was chosen by the gods to lead Nehakara into a golden age. The people of Khemri bowed before their king and simply asked for orders. The king of Khemri stood proudly. Khemri was now united, and he now was known as the first priest king of Khemri. And now he set his eyes towards the nation itself. Setra is a brilliant strategist, talented fighter, and ruthless warlord, and now with the complete devotion of the people of Khemri, he had a powerful army behind him. Setra would lead his armies from the front, never being out of combat as only cowards led from behind, and surely a man blessed by the gods themselves was no coward. One by one the cities fell to the might of Setra and the armies of Khemri. Many of the lesser kings were given a choice, lay down their arms and serve where they will be a part of Nehakara's new golden age, or fight against him. 
and be killed or enslaved. Soon enough, all of Nehakara would be united under the gaze of Setra the Imperishable. A golden age reached the land. None could challenge Setra, now known as the King of Kings, lest they be destroyed or enslaved. For decades there was peace in Nehakara, for none would question the rule of the Imperishable. While he was a tyrant, he did what was best for the gods and his people. Many now had food, water, medical supplies, and their homes being rebuilt. The gods found their old temples restored, and many monuments erected in their honor throughout the land. Any who would wish harm upon Nehakara would quickly meet Setra's wrath, where many greenskin tribes, among others, would be forced to leave the lands before they could be utterly destroyed. Peace was a strange oddity in the Warhammer world, but for a while there was peace. This was not enough to satisfy the King of Kings, however, for there were many lands beyond the borders of Nehakara, many people who did not serve the glorious Setra, and many non-believers who worshipped false gods. By simple order, many armies were mustered, and so did the armies of Nehakara pour out onto the unsuspecting world. Thunderous chariots charged through fields, mighty war fleets left the port cities, foreign kingdoms were unsuspecting of the Nehakaran legions who were now marching throughout their lands. Many cities were reduced to rubble, many slaves were captured, forced to serve until their death. Slowly but surely, Setra the Imperishable's kingdom was growing to a gigantic size. The King of Kings' hunger and ambition knew no limitations. No foe could stand in the way of his dreams, no living enemy too great. But sadly, there was but one thing that could stop Setra. Time. At this point, Setra had ruled for 40 years. He was still vibrant and strong, but age was beginning to catch up with him. Eventually, he would be too old to fight, and his young and booming voice would wither. A small fraction of this massive world had already been under his boot, but there was so much more to conquer, so many who still denied his greatness. He stood atop the Black Mountains, where he could watch over both his lands and those still out of his grasp. Rage consumed him for a moment, where he had realized that even if he were to live for over a hundred years, there would still be lands not under his mighty control. His mortality would be the end of not only him, but the kingdom he sought to create. But death would not claim him, at least not forever. For the mighty king made a vow that he had planned to live until the end of days. Setra became obsessed with life and death, and wished to unlock the secrets of immortality. It was during this time when the famed mortuary cult was formed, which Setra filled out the ranks with only the wisest and most powerful priests in Nehakara. They were to devote their lives to finding out the secrets of immortality, lest they suffer the wrath of the King of Kings. These priests set out upon their quest, traveling to vast unknown reaches across the world, learning much of many other races, and documenting their knowledge for other members of the cult to expand upon. Some degrees of success were indeed found, as the priests of the mortuary cult were able to extend the lifespans of the great king and themselves. But still they yet aged, and eventually they would die. Other secrets were also found, in which the cult had managed to find out how to stop a body from decaying after death, an art which would prove useful in their minds. Although incredible progress had been made, and Setra's life had been extended far beyond that of any normal man, he would eventually die. Great was his wrath, but still they insisted that they were getting ever so close that the mortuary cult could bridge the gap between the realms of life and death, and allow those who had passed to return to the world of the living once again. Setra was left with no other choice other than to believe them, as his body was withering more and more, and death crept closer to him. During his last days, he commanded for a mighty tomb to be built in his name, one worthy for only the true ruler of the world, and would act as his gateway when he eventually returned to rule again. Setra lay dying and surrounded by the mortuary cult. They promised him that they would not cease working on their quest, and they will summon him to a golden world where he would rule for millions of years. 
with anger still fueling his heart, Cetra eventually passed, and so ended the reign of the Great King. His body would be tended to, preserved against decay with powerful magics, and then entombed in a massive golden pyramid which would tower above Kemri as a reminder of the Great King which once lived and that will one day return. Many treasures were buried with him. In the lower reaches of his tomb, many warriors and servants were buried alive, for they would serve the Great King upon his return as they once did in life. The priests of the mortuary cult tended to the pyramid, making sure the powerful incantations placed upon it would never waver while they continued their studies. For many years they advanced. While many new kings rose and died, the mortuary cult grew ever so close, but still yet so far away. They still worked tirelessly on the return of the greatest king to walk the earth once again. Unfortunately for them, and in truth the whole world, one member of the cult had his own ambitions. Nagash, he who wished to rule over any else, had taken the throne of Kemri from his own flesh and blood. He delved into dark magics that even the great Cetra would have forbidden, and with these magics the dead rose. In truth, it is thanks to the Gash that many secrets to eternal life were indeed found, but in his cruelty he plunged Nehakara, and indeed most of the world, into a war which has never been seen before. Were it not for the unlikely alliance between the Skaven and the great King al Qadizar, Nagash would have surely plunged the world into a shroud of undeath. Sadly, as we are all too aware, Nagash was never truly destroyed, only defeated. As Nagash was dying at the hand of a magical warpstone blade, he unleashed a dreadful spell upon Nehakara. The land itself would rot and wither. Those who lived died as the spell seeped into the very ground, where now those recently dead and those long dead rose once again in skeletal form. The interesting thing about the undead of Nehakara awoken during this event is that many of them had varying degrees of intelligence. While simple servants and warriors and so on awoke mindlessly and in need of command, those of higher prestige whose bodies were perfectly preserved by those of the mortuary cult came back with their memories fully intact. Many of these kings had been promised a golden paradise when they reawoke in the realm of the living, yet to their horror they only saw death. Bodies withered away to walking skeletons, Nahakara was shattered and destroyed, where ruins now littered the once proud nation. Despite the horrors that had happened, many of the ancient king's ambitions still stood strong. They believed the land was rightfully theirs, and they alone could rebuild Nehakara to its former glory. There was one major issue, however. If a former king of a city rose again, it was more than likely that many other former kings rose again from that very same city. Kings long dead would now have to face their city's founders for control over a land which all of them felt was rightfully theirs. Undead legions rose as multiple civil wars broke out across the lands where ancient bloodline fought ancient bloodline in a battle for supremacy. There were some who cared not for the infighting, however. The petty arguments of lesser kings would only destroy the already fractured nation. In the shadows stood the mortuary cult, some recently revived, and some untouched by the evils of Nagash's spells. In their mind, None of these kings had any right to rule. Any of them could easily grind down all that remained of this ancient nation into dust. But one man still could save them. A man whose tomb stayed silent within all the fighting. And who had yet to rise again. Cetra. The Great Pyramid of Cetra lay silent throughout the massive civil war that was engulfing all that remained of the Nehekarans. The mortuary cult knew that salvation lay only with the King of Kings, and even though they knew that Cetra's wrath upon seeing a destroyed world and not the golden paradise he was promised would be fierce, there was no other alternative. And it was so that the Grand Hierophant Kateb gathered the cultists and broke the seals that warded Cetra's pyramid. With great concentration, the Grand Hierophant and his fellow colleagues began the incantation of awakening. Time was of the essence, 
But as they strove to awaken the King of Kings, more and more kings were rising, destroying themselves in a brutal civil war. The incantation took several days, but eventually the King of Kings rose again. Cetra rose in undeath, as many kings had before him, and while he was at first taken by surprise due to his new undead state, he would not be delayed for long. His kingdom was in ruins, his subjects destroying themselves at the command of lesser kings. He quickly rallied his forces and cut through the armies of the lesser kings, none of which expected the return of the greatest warrior and commander Nehekara had ever seen. One by one, the lesser kings were defeated. Many of them were given the option of serving Cetra, with some born after the great king and brought up learning the many deeds of the imperishable gladly laying down their arms in servitude. Those who still yet denied the King of Kings had their armies destroyed, and they themselves would be ground to dust, forever to be forgotten. Even Arkan the Black, most trusted of Nagash, was unable to halt Cetra's mighty legions as they swelled in numbers, much like they did in ancient days, and he was forced to flee. Soon enough, all of Nehekara was under his wrathful gaze, as Cetra returned to the throne of Khemri to make sense of the situation. Why was he awoken? Where was his golden paradise? Why were he and his people skeletal monstrosities? Where were the desert gods? Did they abandon Nehekara? The mortuary priests informed Cetra of the events which led to his awakening, Nehekara's downfall, the rise of Nagash, the reanimating of the dead, and the almost complete death of the world. Enraged and with good reason, Cetra looked upon his realm. He had been promised to rule for millions of years upon his great return, and Undeath was not going to stop that from happening. Cetra commanded the lesser kings to return to their tombs, and that he will call on them when the time was right. For now was the time to think and watch, to survey the land and rebuild the once proud cities. Nahakara was now the land of the dead, and it would once again rise as it had many millennia before. Cetra stood watch over his realm, biding his time, for soon enough his legions would be ready to be unleashed upon the world, and he may finally rule it as was his right. He was all too aware of the possibility of the great necromancer Nagash returning to steal his kingdom, as he did many years after his death. So he kept a watchful eye, destroying any of Nagash's servants that he may come across. For a thousand years Cetra stood watch, time no longer an issue. He would study on how the world had changed so much over the years, when new nations had risen and fallen, and many new threats now existed. In some cases, some primitive tribes sought to sack the presumed dead nation of Nehakara seeking the valuable treasures of ancient times within. Most were repelled, with Cetra never truly unleashing the might of the undead legions. Yet one would eventually test his wrath, for a primitive northern tribe had come in full force to sack his kingdom, awakening those who slept within the sand. One by one, legions of undead warriors rose and charged into the thieves from the north, slaughtering them before they knew what horrors were truly happening. More and more undead rose as the invaders found themselves surrounded and outnumbered. The Norskans, however, were relentless and fought with all their might, leading charge after charge towards their undead attackers. Their chieftain, Valgar the Butcher, commanded his warriors to hold fast as the undead numbers swarmed around them, and a figure atop a mighty golden chariot was seen charging at him. Both great warriors were locked in a brutal duel, with Cetra eventually being struck by Valgar's runic axe. Surely this would mean the death for any normal man, but Cetra was no longer a man. His body burst into ravenous beetles, which quickly devoured Valgar, before returning to Cetra's tomb to reform. The Norskans, upon seeing their lord literally being devoured before their very eyes, fled but not before stealing Cetra's crown, which had fallen to the ground as the beetles made their way back to Cetra's pyramid. You would think that the Norskans would know better than to steal from the King of Kings, however, they were not that intelligent, 
and took the coveted crown back to the realms of Norska. Setra, after reforming, was consumed with rage. How dare they take his crown? And with his anger, he mustered forth the might of Nehakara and launched an invasion of Norska. Many Norskan tribes found themselves under assault as armies of undead legions marched through the frozen wasteland in order to regain the king's crown. As powerful as these chaos-infused warriors were, they were no might for the king of kings and his army of undead warriors. The invasion was not for conquest, but rather to regain stolen artifacts. After the crown had been recovered, and now many Norskins lay dead, Setra commanded his armies to return to Nehekara. They were done here. This land meant nothing. For the next few millennia, the Tomb Kings of Nehekara, under the command of Setra, would lay in wait as they rebuilt and mustered their strength. Every now and again, ancient war fleets would be spotted across the known reaches of the world. Armies of undead warriors and terrifying constructs would be spotted entering long-forgotten tombs. But still they were relatively unheard of, for Setra commanded them to lay in wait and only strike when the time was right under his command. When soon enough, the Age of Expansion would be declared, and the armies of Nehakara would march out of their ancient tombs in a bid to finally conquer the world for their king. As we are all too aware, such a time never came, for the catastrophic event known as the End Times started shortly after. A series of events that we'll be covering in a few videos in the future. But before we end this video, I wanted to do something kind of fun and state Setra's known titles. Obviously, this is actually an uncompleted list. As Setra had so many titles, it would take literal days to actually say them all. But as we are aware, some are very commonly known. So without further ado, let's begin. Setra, Great King. The Imperishable, Kemrika, the Great King of Nehakara, King of Kings, Opener of the Way, Wielder of the Divine Flame, Punisher of Nomads, the Great Unifier, Commander of the Golden Legion, Sacred of Appearance, Bringer of Light, Father of Hawks, Builder of Cities, Protector of the Two Worlds, Keeper of the Hours, Chosen of Petra, High Steward of the Horizon, Sailor of the Great Vitae, Sentinel of the Two Realms, The Undisputed, Begetter of the Begat, Scourge of the Faithless, Carrion Feeder, First of the Charnel Valley, Rider of the Sacred Chariot, Vanquisher of Vermin, Champion of the Death Arena, Mighty Lion of the Infinite Desert, Emperor of the Shifting Sands, he who holds the scepter, great hawk of the heavens, arch sultan of Atalan, waker of the hero titan, monarch of the sky, majestic emperor of the shifting sands, champion of the desert gods, breaker of the ogre clans, builder of the great pyramid, terror of the living, master of the never ending horizon, master of the necropolises, Taker of Souls, Tyrant to the Foolish, Bearer of Petra's Holy Blade, Scion of Urisian, Scion of Nehek, The Great, Chaser of Nightmares, Keeper of the Royal Herod, Founder of the Mortuary Cult, Banisher of the Grand Hierophant, High Lord Admiral of the Death Fleets, Guardian of the Charnel Pass, Tamer of the Lich King, Unliving Jackal Lord, Demiser of the Warrior Queen, Charioteer of the Gods, He Who Does Not Serve, Slayer of Redithras, Scarab Purger, Favoured of Orisian, Player of the Great Game, Liberator of Life, Lord Sand, Wrangler of Scorpions, Emperor of the Dunes, Eternal Sovereign of Kemri's Legions, Senechal of the Great Sandy Desert, Cursorer of the Living, Regent of the Eastern Mountains, Warden of the Eternal Necropolis, Herald of all the Heralds, Caller of the Bitter Wind, God Tamer, Master of the Mortis River, 
guardian of the dead, great keeper of the obelisks, deacon of the Ash River, belated of the wakers, general of the mighty fame, summoner of the sandstorms, master of all necrotechs, prince of dust, tyrant of Araby, purger of the greenskin breathers, killer of the false gods champions, tyrant of the gold dunes, golden bone lord, avenger of the dead, carrion master, eternal warden of Nehex lands, breaker of the Jaff's bonds, and so many more. But with that, my friends, we've come to the end of our lore video. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, might I suggest giving the video a like, or even subscribing to the channel, as it really does help us out. Once again, thank you so much for watching, and I shall see you all again very, very soon. Have a good day.